So welcome. This program is going to be about the archaeological aspects of Castle Karagnokora and the surrounding area. Now one of the things you'll notice on this program is that sometimes we're in a driving rain, lashing rain, all the various different types of rain, but uh, sometimes we're in brilliant sunshine. And that's Ireland. You have a seemingly unending series of Atlantic storms through the winter and then the sun breaks out and it's brilliant. But uh, writer Gil Rob Wilson I think said it best when he he said if you've never been afraid you've never been courageous and if you haven't been through the storms it's hard for you to appreciate the beauty of a sun-kissed valley. Here we are at Castle Karagnokora, and I want to share with you one of my favorite aspects of this restoration project, and that is the archaeology. Now, we are required by uh, regulation to uh, clear the area where we're going to have uh, heavy construction, and the scaffolding is going to be based right here. It's going to go all the way around the tower, the keep, and up past the top so that we can rebuild the, the top crenellation. But, uh, the archaeologists have already cleared a substantial portion. This is the uh, north wall here. We have the River Lee just right down here behind us. And uh, what they've done is to, to peel back the turf and to dig down to the bedrock here and excavate. And I want to show you a couple of spots here. Uh, this is really uh, one of the most significant finds uh, was found right here and it was a, a coin. A silver groat and uh, it was found by Pete our uh, archaeological uh, excavator really a sharp man uh, he's very good at excavation and he has a sharp eye and he spotted this small tiny little coin which is is black in color now but uh, it's a silver groat and it was clipped back uh, in antiquity where they would trim around the outside ed edge of coin in order to take some of the silver or gold, silver in this case, uh, to make another coin. So it's very small now, but it has a, a, a monarch indicated on it. And we have to send that to a, uh, a conservatory in uh, Cork to determine which king. It's probably one of the uh, Edwards, but uh, uh, they tended not to change coins very much back in that time uh, so that people would not be suspicious of them. So it's, you can't just look at the coin and say, oh, that's Edward II or the third or fourth. It really has to be examined uh, by uh, a professional uh, curator who's going to know uh, some of the details to look for. Now, uh, some of the other things we have found here uh, over in this part of the trench, uh, down here, I found uh, a piece of uh, flint from a uh, flintlock musket and uh, then over in this part of the trench uh, our archaeologist, the project archaeologist Tony Miller found a huge collection of bones, animal bones and it appears that this was an area where they dumped the uh, refuse from the kitchen. Now. Uh, one of the things we've been trying to figure, uh, archaeology has to have a certain logic to it, and uh, what we couldn't figure out is how people walked around this facility. If you lived and worked here every day, this would be very difficult. We have a hard time ourselves walking around here. And it was then that we found some of these uh, carved platforms. Uh, and, and it's a flat area, looks like a good footprint for a post. And there are several of them uh, all the way around this tower, the keep. And so we thought perhaps there's a wooden platform that uh, went around this bedrock to allow them to walk uh, easier. And also, uh, we have found some tower bases out away from the keep that would indicate a defensive tower and if there were a wooden platform here you would be able to see out over the top of the tower now uh, in fact let me show show you one of those uh, 
tower bases now. It's over uh, a little bit away from the main tower. But you can see right here that we have uh, vertical walls and uh, 90 degree angles. And when you see a 90 degree angle uh, with vertical walls, you can pretty much uh, take it to the bank that it's not a natural uh, occurrence. And then what really uh, solidified this for us is in addition to this foundation base here, uh, over in this clump of trees down there, I found another one. And so then based on the distance from this one to that one, I went further downstream and found another one, and then the same distance further, I found a fourth. So we're real certain that there was some kind of a defensive wall here. And uh, uh, many Irish tower houses will have what's called a bond wall, which is really just to protect the livestock. And it might have one tower, maybe two. But uh, when you find this many square base towers around uh, a facility that's that's probably predates this Irish tower house uh, it, it starts to look like a military defensive wall and of course we are here where the ancient uh, McCroom to Dunmanway Road crosses the River Lee so you have two main transportation arteries and so this uh, castle dune fort whatever might have been here prior uh, on this big uh, promontory of uh, bedrock would have uh, commanded this crossroads. And so that's our current theory. Uh, and as we find various things, the picture is becoming more clear to us. But we've also found uh, uh, different things like uh, uh, we found a, uh, the metal heel of a, of a shoe uh, just the other day in the spoils which is this pile over here. Uh, in the spoils, I found uh, some china. That's probably, uh, oh, 19th century, early to mid 19th century china that was in here. So maybe a teapot or teacup. But this is uh, the spoils from the trench. And after a heavy rain, you can see some of the things that you may have missed initially. Now, speaking of missing things, on archaeological sites all over the world, you'll see this. This is called a void. And what this is, is leaving some of the original ground level so that you can see what it was like. You can document uh, the original ground level. Plus, you're able to see some of the stratification. And it's always been my theory that all over the, the planet, at archaeological sites, the greatest finds the most incredible pieces that have never been found are all located inside the void. That's just my theory. Okay, here we are on the east side where the, uh, the main door used to be. This whole area uh, was harvested for stone. So the door was removed and all the nice uh, carved stone and, and a lot of the rest of it was removed. And what they used to do is just uh, grind it up to make gravel for the roads. So, uh, in fact, the uh, corners on this uh, structure have been repaired because there was an attempt to knock this tower down. Now it survived even that. Uh, so, uh, we have some work to do here in restoring the original doorway. But what we have here are the uh, initial trenching uh, for the uh, archaeological survey that has to be done before we can put up the scaffolding. So basically right now what we've done is to just uh, remove the turf, but we've had a series of Atlantic storms come through and it has been quite difficult to get any of this uh, work to continue until the storm season has passed. But while we're here I can show you something that our archaeologist has determined uh, these stones here were originally up at the top of the tower. Now what happened was 
uh, after Cromwell uh, defeated the Irish forces, um, he put a man named Roger Boyle in charge of knocking the castles, in other words, demilitarizing them. So uh, Roger Boyle set up his headquarters at Blarney Castle and he sent crews around to all the castles in the area and they would push over the crenellation and all of the other defenses from the top and then would come crashing down here to the ground. Now in addition to these, we also found some stone uh, weapons, I guess you would call them. Uh, if you look at keeps, towers, walls and such, you'll notice that uh, there is a tendency to uh, splay out the bottom. So you have a vertical wall, <laughs> isn't that beautiful? Vertical wall comes straight down and then at the bottom it angles out. And that is so, when you're at the top, all you have to do is just drop one of these stones about the size of a cannonball over the side and it falls vertically. And when it hits this angled piece here, it ricochets out and fires out horizontally like a cannonball. So it's quite an effective weapon actually. And over on this uh, south side, uh, we were able to find a whole grouping of these stones that are specifically uh, used for this defensive purpose. And they were found down here uh, by Tony Miller uh, in a group. So that tells you that at some point somebody was up on top and they found that collection of stone and just pushed them all over and they all fell down into this area where they were found. Okay, now we're inside the great vaulted hall inside the keep, and this is a fascinating room, and it offers one of the rare chances to date a stone building, and that's because of the way the vault was built. If you can see, it's, it's made out of a basket weave, and on top of this gigantic basket, they would put mortar and small stones and larger stones, and here and there you can still see some of the sticks that were used to build the basket weave. So we will be sending off some of those uh, twigs and sticks to a lab in order to have those dated because you can date the organic material. And from that we'll at least get a good feel for when the vault was built. <laughs> Okay, so here we are at the southwest corner of the tower, the keep. And this is one of my favorite places for pondering all of the things that have happened here. Uh, first of all, uh, when the uh, British took Karagnakura from the O'Leary clan, they gave it to a defense contractor, the Hollow Blade Sword Company, who had manufactured a lot of the weapons for the, uh, the war against the uh, revolution in the colonies, the American Revolution. Um, and so the Hollow Blade Sword Company then sold this property to a family from England, uh, last name of Masters. And they made some major changes here that have reverberated through history. The biggest change they made was to close this road down here. That little road used to be the main road from McCroom to Dunmanway, two very old towns. But they wanted to... Uh, 
put a perimeter around the castle. And so they set up gates and they established a perimeter. Well, the village of what's now Inchgila used to be located right here, right out in those fields and to the south of us here. And so they invited the villagers to move on. So they went just a couple of kilometers down the road to the next good ford in the river and they established the village of Inchgila, which you see now. Uh, and so out here there's, there's so many opportunities to, to learn more about uh, the function of, of the society in relation to this castle. Now um, one of the other things we're going to have to do is uh, we did a preliminary trench earlier uh, last year and it's now uh, we had to fill it back in and it's starting to get overgrown again but that was a preliminary trench for the archaeological permit and now we're going to have to go back in and especially down there in the flat excavate uh, before we do any uh, installation of a car park or, or the septic system. Um, so there's a lot of potential down there, but uh, one of the things that uh, baffled us because of the logic that must work in archaeology is that this was a pretty poor approach to the castle if you're living here and working here. So eventually we discovered what might be a ramp down here on the other side, which we'll have to look at later. Now, one of my favorite uh, stories about this castle involves uh, Prince Edward, uh, Prince of Wales, under uh, Queen Victoria. He made a trip to Ireland and he traveled from Bantry on his last leg through here on the stagecoach route. Now, when the village was located here, there was a stagecoach uh, horse transfer depot. Uh, you'd ride for a while with a set of horses and then you'd change the horses. So that was right down here. And when you consider how long it takes to travel by coach or by carriage, and when they would do the swap of the horses, clearly they did a horse swap here. So that means the passengers from the carriage or the coach would get out and walk around a bit while they traded out the horses. So that means that somewhere on this site, Edward, Prince of Wales under Queen Victoria, had to relieve himself. So we're going to put up a stone monument somewhere here and with you know a nice uh, carving of, of the legend first in Irish and then maybe in Latin and then finally in English about how uh, Edward, Prince of Wales under Queen Victoria in 1858 urinated here. Now tourists being <laughs> anxious for any stone monument will gather around and take their group photos prior to reading the inscription. Now what castle would be complete without Swan? And if you look carefully down there, you can see our resident Swan. Okay, so now this is the field just west of the castle. The castle is right uh, behind me up there. And this field is where the uh, helicopter is going to land for the medevac when I fall off of that. Now, uh, out here in West Cork, they have this brilliant service where they use these light helicopters to fly in paramedics and to haul out uh, patients. And uh, they, a helicopter was on a call here in Inchgila, and I went out and spoke with one of the pilots, and we discussed medevac from the castle here. And uh, we discussed the approaches and the lack of obstacles from, for this field, and uh, just planned ahead. So after they were finished with their call, he flew over here and flew around the castle and checked out this field. Now you're probably wondering why I would even think of such a thing. Well, when I was a young lad, I was in Scouts, and you know our motto, be prepared. Okay, here we are on the hillside to the south, up over the Lee Valley. Uh, right down there is the river with the lake and the Cronogue and the Castle Ketteragnacura and Dolmen and stone circles and standing stones. But this is a ring fort. 
And there are ring forts all around Castle Caragnacura, but this one is in pristine condition. And these predate the Norman invasion. So presumably this is built in the 1100s at the latest. So I'm really excited about the prospects of being able to examine this ring fort. Here we are at Nakrahin. Now we're on the, the hills to the north of Castle Caragnacura. And we're on kind of a saddle in the top of the hills. And this is a most amazing sight. It's at least 5,000 years old. And some of these uh, particular uh, things that you'll see here are even older. This is the Cairn burial of a very significant person. And there are dozens of burials around this circle. Um, and it's a huge circle. It's larger than Stonehenge, just for reference. Uh, but there are uh, wedge tombs and, and passage tombs and cairns and, and dolmen all around us here. But what's amazing to me is that this person was so significant that they are the focal point of this circle. Now, of course, there's astronomical alignments and various other alignments here, but this had to be somebody of great importance. Now, unfortunately, this tomb was robbed in antiquity and some of the others as well, but there's still so much to learn here. And uh, it's just amazing to me that we're talking about some of the, the earliest settlers of Ireland after the ice sheet retreated. So we're talking about some of the original pre-Celtic uh, Stone Age uh, people from both the Neolithic and Mesolithic era. Okay, here we are still at Nakrahin at one of the other burial sites. And uh, as I look at this, uh, we know somebody of significance is buried here and perhaps some other family members or other significant people with them. But when I see something like this, in spite of the fact that it's thousands of years old, I can't help but think that the family of this person was gathered around this spot, right where I'm standing, and they were mourning this loss. The people experienced all the same emotions that we do. So I always think of the family here and beyond that, the community. This, this ceremonial site is gigantic. So there must have been the ability to hold thousands of people inside this circle. And I just, I picture the people here gathered at this burial and that one and that one over there. There are so many sites here that, and this site lasted for thousands of years. So you see the changes in the burial ceremonies, but still you can sense the emotion, the loss, and the desire to make their burial significant so that it's not lost to time. And it hasn't been. Here we are, thousands of years later, still acknowledging this person. Of course, crystals are very important to the ceremony uh, of the people that were here, but it's just remarkable to find crystals of this size, or at least crystalline stones. But these were set here for some specific purpose. And it's possible that the electromagnetic field uh, that, that passes through the Earth uh, is somehow marked or amplified with these stones. <clears throat> Isn't this gorgeous? This is the view right outside the front of the little stone cot cottage that we're renting while we're restoring Castle Caragnacura, which is just down the road a little bit. Um, this actually is the River Lee where it widens out to form this lake. Now, first of all, let me address one of the issues here today. Sunglasses in Ireland in the wintertime. People in the village are running around screaming, there's a big fireball in the sky. <laughs> Uh, we've had quite a few Atlantic storms come through, so consequently um, our lake and, and river are up at flood stage. But what I want to uh, draw your attention to is this fabulous uh, small little man-made island in the middle of the lake. This was built by the Danes 
during the time of the Vikings. And it was to keep their silver and gold and other such things safe. But when I come out here to have coffee in the morning or uh, tea, as it might be, um, I look out there and I think, wow, eight or nine hundred years ago, if I was sitting here having my coffee, I would be watching Vikings in their smaller lake river boats gathered around that spot, driving these wooden uh, beams, these pilings, into the bottom of the lake, then throwing stones in to build up this island, and then building up the top so they can keep all of their belongings safe. Now, uh, it, you know, it's not Fort Knox, but you're not going to get the casual burglar to wander by, and uh, if somebody makes a withdrawal, everybody around here would be able to see it. So I'm just fascinated by that. I think about the people that lived in this very spot uh, through all the ages. I asked the farmer here, <laughs> how, how old is this farm? And he says, well, it's been here forever. And that's so true of so many of the things here that, you know, through Neolithic times, uh, Mesolithic, through the time of the Vikings and the Celts, through the time of the Norman invasion and the movement of the O'Learys up here into the Lee Valley, uh, the Cromwellian invasion, uh, all of these different things have all occurred uh, right at this spot. And, you know, from Neolithic times, the population was huge here. There are so many dolmen and stone circles and standing stones and ring forts and uh, remains from the Viking era and these forts and and uh, dunes and uh, the castles and the tower houses. It's just a, a wonderful place to live where you're immersed in the... So here's another view of the Viking Cronogue, the place where they kept their silver and gold safe. But you have to ask yourself, if the Danes built that, who built this mound and what is in there? We've had flooding, so you can see the ground level here from the flooded pasture. And you can see how large that mound is. And there's what's known to be a Viking Grenoble. Okay, so now I'm in the village of Inchgila, just a short walk from the castle, just down, down the uh, River Lee here. And I'm uh, in the park that's called the Island of the Hostages. And it's called that because this little island ended up the place where some Danish, uh, Norse, Viking, whatever you'd like to call them, uh, where they were held as hostages. Now what happened was that during the Norman invasion, uh, the Normans landed and the Irish clans started bumping into each other as they were shuffling around uh, Ireland. And the uh, O'Leary clan moved from Ross Carberry, where they had their, their uh, base from which they, they sailed their ships for raiding and trading, and they moved up here to the Lee Valley. Well, there were Vikings living here, but they came to some sort of an agreement, and as part of that agreement, a group of the Norse Danes stayed here and lived on the island, and a group of the O'Learys went and lived with the Danes, wherever it was that they moved on to. Now this was done back in ancient times, so that when they would come up with some kind of a peace treaty, they had some uh, means of ensuring that it would be kept. And so the two groups involved in the treaty would trade hostages. They weren't uh, exactly kidnapped, they were just traded to ensure that the peace would be kept. So if you were here a few years ago, a few hundred years ago, you would have seen longhouses and a Danish village on this little Okay, now we're further south of Castle Carignacoura in the Lee Valley. In fact, we're all the way down to the coast, on the Atlantic coast of uh, Ireland. And this is a place called Ross Carberry, and it's a perfect little bay. But this is where the O'Leary clan began, and uh, their earliest records are from this place. And this bay is where they kept their ships, and they were 
really more like the Vikings of the later time periods, but this was pre-Norman invasion. They would go raiding and trading, and they'd raid the coast of Wales and Cornwall, and presumably even further. But they would come back here where their ships were safe from the storms. There's a little inlet passage that comes in from the ocean. And the other thing they did here that was so important was that they uh, they had a, a monastery with a school, but it was really more of what you would call a university today. And people would come from all over Europe to study here at Ross Carberry. And it's often said that the Irish monks saved Western civilization. Well, this is how, because when the Roman Empire collapsed, they were still here in these safe enclaves, uh, preserving history and art and academics of the Roman and pre-Roman time period. Now what a perfect place to conclude an archaeological survey of Castle Caragnacura. Now we're here at Drombeg Circle and whether you're an O'Leary or Leary or related to the clan in, in some way, this is your ancient stone circle. Now, we're in the hills up above Ross Carberry, where the clan began, and back prior to the uh, Norman invasion, these hills would have been filled with the O'Leary clan, or those people who ultimately became the O'Learys, and this was their stone circle. And they not only used this, but likely built it. Now, it's thousands of years old. It's on an uh, astronomical alignment for the winter solstice, because especially if you're a clan that is uh, based on ocean-going uh, boats and ships, uh, it's important to know when you're out raiding and trading when to stop your oceanic voyages in the wintertime. And it's very important to know when to start planting your crops in the spring. Now, in the center here, under that stone, a burial was found back in 1957, and it was a young person who was cremated and buried there. And the burial was dated to 1000 BC. So the burial itself was 3000 years old when it was discovered. And whoever it was, even though they were young, they were significant enough to bury here in the center of this circle. And if you're an O'Leary, chances are good that's one of your ancestors there. But this stone circle would have been where your ancestors performed their rituals or ob observed the passing of the calendar. And then beyond this circle, off this direction, you see some of the other structures that they used. Now, uh, up in the uh, hills above McCroom, uh, they've recently put in a road and they found uh, dozens of these type stone structures and they have a unique facility. There's a trough and uh, some kind of a liquid was heated in this trough and what they would do is heat up a stone till it was very hot and drop it into the liquid and then the stone would crack and they'd discard the stone. And that's how they, were, they know that they were uh, heating up a liquid. Now, it could be that these were for sweat lodges, that uh, you would first go and, and participate in some kind of a sweat lodge ceremony before coming over here to the stone circle. That's likely. Or it could be that that's how they were cooking uh, meat, for example, because meat was quite often boiled. But the important thing, if you are an O'Leary, to come here and look out at these hills and imagine your ancestors living here in... Neolithic times and coming to this circle. Do you hear that? Can you hear that? That's your ancestors calling you to come back to this point where the castle Caragnacura and the occupation of the Lee Valley and the movement across Ireland and the famine when your ancestors likely moved to the country you're living in now. This is where it began. Can you hear them? They're calling you.